Welcome to the Home Service Expert, where each week, Tommy chats with world-class entrepreneurs and experts in various fields like marketing, sales, hiring, and leadership to find out what's really behind their success in business. Now, your host, the Home Service Millionaire, Tommy Mello. Hey guys, welcome back to the Home Service Expert. Today's going to be Angle is scaling your home service business with effective systems. And I'm here with Dennis Hugh and Mark Wagner. Excited to have Pleasure you guys Tommy. on today. This is awesome. going to be fun. I love what these guys are doing. We're going to talk about all their accomplishments after the podcast. But right now, we're going to just start out. I mean, you guys have accomplished a lot with BizMetrics. Uh, I know you are a contributor of Social Times. You're a technical marketer at Yahoo. You were the airlines American Airlines project manager. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff here of what they've done, uh, so it's impressive. Tell me a little bit about where you guys have come from about your business, and really, I think effective systems is really what we're going to try to pull yeah. out of this towards home service businesses, yeah. but uh, I want to hear from you guys a little bit, so I don't know who wants to start. I'll but, start. Yeah. So Mark and I are weird birds because we're engineers that know a little bit about marketing, and when you're systems oriented, like I came from the airline industry 22 years ago. Think about what happens in the airlines when something goes wrong. A flight attendant calls in sick. There's a weather pattern. There's a strike. Something's wrong with the equipment, like the landing gear doesn't work. There's always a backup system. And we found that when you can put systems that's necessary for scaling. In American, we had 2,100 flights a day with 730 aircraft. Think about all the things that need to coordinate so that people don't die in the aircraft. And because of the systems we built, like Sabre, which was initially for American Airlines, that was for fare planning, capacity planning, food and beverage, cargo. We sold that to all the other airlines. And the amount of data that we had was incredible. That stuff there, we then built Yahoo's analytics. That was 13 terabytes a day, bigger than any commercial database on the planet. Only the CIA would have more data than we had. And when things like Facebook came about, Mark and I were there, uh, both Marks, Zuckerberg and Mark Wagner, and we said, <laughs> What an incredible data opportunity. Can we not apply simple heuristic rules to be able to help small businesses that are trying to drive sales? Because if, if Facebook is an algorithm, understands who your friends are mm -hmm. and who you're with and where, you, and where your phone is and can predict who your next customer is going to be, how do we leverage that? So we've built dashboards that look at it from the standpoint of if you're Facebook or if you're Google, how are you looking at it as a network to give the network the signals that he wants? We were talking about SEO early, yep. earlier, right? And we have some common friends. How do we, I don't want to say trick, but how do we feed Google the particular elements that will help us show up in the local three pack? That will help us show up when someone types in, fix my broken garage door. Yep. And these are things that are not secrets. These are basic mechanics that we know that small businesses just don't understand. And thus, you can be really good at fixing toilets, really good at roofing, really good at fixing cars, but awful when it comes to systematic marketing. You know, there's something that we're working on. We're with a company called Service Titan, and uh, they're, they're really, really smart company. It's uh, about $3 billion company right now, started in 2014. And what we're starting to pull in is analytics from all these different places to understand who our best customers are. So it's called regression testing. Mm -hmm. And we're taking in... Average income of the home, credit card score, how much they paid off when they moved in. Yep. For example, how many garages they have. And we're able to really make sure we're marketing to the right people. And I think a lot of times in home service, we market to the wrong mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And not to say that uh, the, the right people might be that, that $90,000 double income, to, you know, man and wife. And literally, they're, they're not afraid to spend $15,000 on an air conditioning. Yeah. Whereas the other company, you know, you go to Paradise Valley, some of the richer areas, mm -hmm. you're just not getting that much bang for your buck on yeah. the spending. So yeah. I think it's pretty interesting to think that, hey, people say we should market to Paradise Valley, these rich areas. Well, most of those people have account managers kind mm -hmm. of managing their stuff and looking. Yeah. They've got one air conditioning guy that comes and does everything for mm -hmm. all their homes. Mm -hmm. They've negotiated cheaper pricing. Yeah. So... I think you're talking, when you talk about algorithms, we're trying to predict how much money a customer is willing to spend with us because I might find a million dollar client that will use us all the time versus mm -hmm. the one household person. So yep. interesting stuff. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, so you've got a lot of businesses and systems and processes and standard operating procedures. 
Uh, you know, these guys that I'm working with are putting in 10 to 14 hours a day. Mm-hmm. They're putting out fires all day long. What's important, you know, tell me a little bit about, seems like for me, we the milestone we got to is standing up standard operating procedures, manuals, knowing how to win the game. Mm-hmm. Most people that I work with, they say, go hang out with this person for a week and that's your training. And... How do you really put systems together? Because building systems is a is a learning experience. So how do you do that? Well, when it's just you and it's a small team, you can spend time one on one and coach them. But when you have larger and larger teams and you have teams of teams, you have to actually document. And anything that we know how to do, we are putting into a checklist. We're recording a five minute video saying this is how you do this particular thing. That way we have consistency. We put a quiz against it. We create a certification. Without that. You're going to have failure. You're not going to have reliability. You're not going to have consistency. And thus, we accidentally became a training company because in the thousands of young adults that we've trained as certified digital marketers, I found and Mark has found that we can't train these people one-on-one. We have to provide the foundation. And then as they are helping companies that do air conditioning and HVAC or carpet repair, that they actually know what to do. So the same systems that we use to train them to become pro at digital marketing are the same systems that they're using to implement so that we know we have quality control because we can look at the checklist and say, which of these items did you do? And if they didn't do one of these items, here's what we need to do to be able to fix it. So this is kind of important. I want to explain to the audience or have you guys explain exactly what it is you guys do with this training program and how it could apply to home services because Mm -hmm. I've got two guys in there. Uh, about 30 and 25 yep. and all they do is figure out what, how to get guest blog links. They yep. figure out what citation sites we're not on. They figure out what marketing is over a percentage of our revenue right. and they build in analytics. And yep. we're right now, I got to tell you, we're more of a technology company than a garage company. We're a marketing agency and we're a revenue generator. We've got an LMS. Yep. We've got a yep. whole learning yep. management system designed. We've got a whole recruiting system built into Zoho. Yep. All these things built together that uh, I'm telling you, we probably have 10 different things we're using. I, I'm not using yeah. Infusionsoft anymore because we switched to Zoho, but yeah. very familiar with all these different things. So yeah. explain to everybody what you do and how important this stuff is and why they might think about hiring one of the people you guys work with. Absolutely. We have training programs in 10 different universities where these young adults, and some not so young because modern college, you have people in their 30s, single moms, they are getting certified as digital marketers as they're getting their degree and being able to help you guys audit your business Think about it this way, then Mark can explain how metrics analysis action works. So, Tommy, when's the last time you've been to the doctor? Or maybe like mm. a dentist? Mm. Right? Oh, I got a dentist appointment tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> so, when you go to the doctor, let's say that, you know, you go to the emergency room because your, your son, you know, breaks his arm or something like that, right? What do they do? First thing is they have an intake process where they collect the metrics. So, they're collecting the vitals, the blood pressure, the x-rays, right? And then they move into the diagnostics, meaning, well, based on this... And the chart, it looks like you've got a broken bone. It looks like this is wrong. It looks like your liver isn't working. It looks like you know have a gunshot wound, whatever it is, right? And then we move to the action. This is what you need to do. Shouldn't it be like that for your marketing? How often do you have systematic marketing? And I think about other home services businesses. You've heard everything from everybody on you should do this and you should do that and everyone should take two pills and you know call me in the morning. But what if, what if we use data and systems and checklists so the recommendations we made were based on your data and then if we made those rec- if we implemented those recommendations we can loop back and see are we ranking better on Google are we getting more leads is our conversion rate increasing is whatever the business metric is we're looking for working that's, yeah. that's what we teach so we we are systems people but we're using it on marketing data and Mark specializes as an AI engineer. So he's 10 times more intelligent than I am when it comes to looking at the data. I build automation systems. So in a few years, maybe we'll have this all being done automatically. But for right now, we go through a standard checklist to do it. So I make, I make scorecards and I kind of analyze where things are going right and wrong from like a 40,000 foot view. And then zero in on certain things, right down to the actual ads themselves. Oh, this ad performed better. Let's boost this. Let's do better here. And uh, a lot of it's already done by the algorithms at and Facebook. It's and- not black box, right? Often we think of algorithms as, you know, the, these movies where the robot gets smart and takes over the world and there's some evil guy and now the robots are all revolting. That's not how we view algorithms. We view them as being better sorting through the data to figure out, let's say, all the reviews that you've ever gotten. Or all the people who've ever said something positive about one of your employees or great service on Twitter. 
do you know how to figure out which of those is the most powerful and which of those things you should push out there as ads on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or whatnot? What if there's a system that could do that? What if there's a system that could figure out, you know what, your data, your, your name, address, and phone aren't quite right as it's bubbling all the way through up through Yext and therefore on Twitter, it's not, you know, people can't check in because the name, mm -hmm. address, and phone isn't correct, right? Or you changed your phone or you have a, a different contact email. Like what, what if we just had a system that was a, a housekeeping robot that could do that and we trained young adults and being able to go through this training to be able to do, use this scorecard and implement it, then it's not on this crazy expertise. This is not Mad Men where you're trying to come up with a great campaign. If you're a home service business, it's very clear what you do. There's a hundred other people that do the same thing. How do you stand out? You fix these basic items, you tell your story, you let your customers do the work for you. And these are all things, like these young adults, they're all amazing at social media, right? Mm -hmm. Like we have young adults in our program, I don't even know how to use Snapchat. And they're showing me how to do that and TikTok, right? Are you on TikTok? I'm not, but all my people are, and I'm like, I don't have all night to sit around and watch these videos. But you know what? It's becoming, that's that's the millennials, and we don't get a lot of money yet from millennials. Yeah. We're starting to, but understanding how it all works, and we're starting to, so. But they're buying homes. Mr. Mark here is 27. He owns multiple homes. Yeah, you know what? They are buying homes, and they're finally <laughs> moving out of their parents' house. And I'm a millennial, so I'm allowed yeah. to say that I'm right on the tail end of it. But yeah. uh, So one of the things I talk about a lot is understanding your numbers, and it's all really... It's a system which takes in the numbers. Mm -hmm. My booking rate. Yeah. So I start like this. I start off with what's your average ticket. Yeah. And then your average ticket's broken because I believe marketing is really relative. Mm -hmm. I don't tell people to fix your marketing. Mm -hmm. Marketing is the last thing I fix. Mm -hmm. And here's why. You're not booking the calls you're getting. Mm -hmm. So your call center sucks. Your face-to-face -face conversion rate is horrible. Then I look at What's your average ticket mm -hmm. and why is it so low? And when you take these numbers and multiply them by each other, you yeah. start getting this number. Yeah. And then you got to look at cost per acquisition, which you yeah. guys are talking about. Yeah. And the place to start for most of the home service business owners is where are your systems to analyze what's your booking rate? What's a real, where are you going to find out what CSR? So I'm a big fan of a round robin that's weighted for your best people. Right. Whether that's your best technician out there selling whether that's the fastest guy if you're on time basis, whether that's booking a phone call. Yeah. And then what's your best marketing and how can you yeah. lift it? Because people are like, how do I get more jobs? I'm like, you don't answer the phone at night. You don't answer the phone on weekends. How do you use technology? So yeah. I've got a backup call yeah. center. After it rings three times, it goes to a nationwide inbound center. Yeah. So there's all these things that I would just tell you guys, especially listening, that fix those before you fix your marketing. But most of you... And I've been to these, I hope the people that are listening are smart enough. Obviously, they're listening because they want help and they're actually working on their business. But the people that aren't listening, that should be listening, don't have a website. They don't understand what the yeah. Google My Business page is. They don't yeah. understand reviews. Yep. I went to buy out this guy's company, $3 million company, yeah. working on a letter of intent right now. He's got 11 Google reviews. He spends $3,500 a month on Google. That's crazy. $3,500 a yeah. month. It's like driving with e-brake on. Oh my gosh, it is. <laughs> it is. So... You know, what do you say to these guys? I, I love this. You know, you got this report and the report is you just threw it together. But it's it's good because it gives you data on where you need to spend your time. And I like it because I'm familiar with a lot of this stuff. Yeah. And then there's errors that need to be fixed. There's, four, yeah. there's 301 redirects and all this stuff yep. that you can fix. So most people don't even driven. realize this. See, you know that if you buy a furniture at Ikea, you could probably follow the directions, put it together. But you probably don't want to because you're busy doing all this other stuff. But at the same time, before you're going to hire anybody, the catch-22 is you want to know what those checklist items are. The good news is that there's a fundamental list. Have they claimed their GMB? Do they have their knowledge panel? Do they have plenty of reviews on Google and Yelp? Does their website load quickly? Do you have things like maybe Google AMP? Do you have a remarketing tag on Google and Facebook that's run through a Google Tag Manager? Do you have a Facebook page and a Facebook business page? Do you have a LinkedIn? Do you have, and do you have certain elements, that you assets that you put on these? The odds are they don't. They don't even have these basics. Half of local businesses don't even have a website. Isn't no. That crazy? They don't. 2020? Now, what if each of those items, we give you that list and we've already audited which of them are there or not, and then if you, if you don't have a particular item, we give you the training to be able to go get that implemented. Maybe you have a young daughter that wants to learn how to do marketing and you just employ her to do it. Maybe you work with interns at ASU here and you create jobs for them. Or maybe you hire virtual assistants in the Philippines. So for us, we're a job creation company, but the work is done based on something that we know that we can audit. And that way everybody wins. So tell me about the training. Transparent. I want to know more about the training because the biggest problem I see with home service owners, home service business owners, uh, 
they just, number one, they don't know how to hire. Mm-hmm. And number two is they don't know how to train. Right. Training is a huge deal that I'm like trying to help people out. Like mm-hmm. you get an A player, you can turn them into a C player really, really quickly if you're not yeah. training them properly. So yeah. tell me about your training. And I think you said it's free to some people. I don't know exactly. If, if you're a young adult and you're enrolled in an accredited university or if you just came out of the military, you can use your GI Bill benefits. It is completely free and there's no strings. It is subsidized by the other organizations that believe in what we're doing, like GoDaddy and Keep and Facebook and Google have contributed. This is not like Google Grants, but it is something that we do because it's something we believe in. We believe mentorship's really important. So if you fit some of that criteria, and I think it's at blitzmetrics.com slash students, you can apply, and it's a work-study program. So you get the certification, and we believe that you can't learn something unless you do it at the same time. So you could learn how to set up websites. You could learn how to set up remarketing to catch people that came to your site but didn't, you know, or how to tie in custom audiences to say, you know, Merry Christmas, how's your family doing, right, automatically. But unless you implement it, you're not going to remember it. So these kids go through this system and they get live clients. And they earn more money than they would at Chili's or whatever, right? Sure. So they're probably averaging 15 to 20 bucks an hour, which is great for the business owner. And then that helps them become... At a certain point, they can either become an agency owner and get more clients, or they can use this to build their resume to be able to get a dream job at some other company. Because maybe they don't want to be a digital marketer, and that's okay. But it's certainly a great experience to learn how to communicate, to learn how to deal with clients, to learn how to write a statement of work, to learn how to deal with project management, because you got to coordinate these different things that have to happen within a checklist. How long is this course? If people are, on average, going, putting in a few hours a day, it's about six weeks. Oh, that's not bad. There's six phases that we call the social amplification engine, which is necessary to implement the full cycle for a local business. Plumbing, goals, content, targeting, amplification, optimization. And we have a course on each of those. And if you're a business owner, you can go through the course too, but you have to pay. So you've got how many courses after that? 48. 48 courses. So training is very, very important to us. We were just with our friend Brad Lee in Vegas. He runs Lightspeed, which is one of the LMSs. And he said, with people, you have either three things. You either fire them, you train them, or you tolerate them. And we don't tolerate, so it's either fire or train. It's almost always a training problem. Always a training problem. So tell me a little bit about how you incentivize and motivate your employees, because me, once I switched to performance pay for almost everybody, Mm -hmm. I mean... Some people are tough, like your finance, but the, the right. finance person has to come out with reports that are accurate in a timely yeah. fashion, but it's really hard to monitor mm-hmm. that because how do you know it's accurate unless you have checks and balances for yeah. that? So yeah. tell me a little bit about motivating the employees because a lot of people say millennials, man, they're hard to motivate. They're hard to get them to do anything. They want to have their own schedule. They want yeah. a bet. they want yeah. gamification. They yeah. want nurturing where yeah. the baby boomers just say, put me into work. I need yeah. money. Yeah. Well, it's an employee versus a contractor model. I think of it this way. It's not that the millennials or Gen Z folks are not motivated, because look at how motivated they are to win in Fortnite, to be that last one after 100 people fly down and shoot each other, right? Look at how motivated they are when it's like a Farmville and they want to win. And yes, gamification, points, leveling, unlocking, randomization, immediate feedback, the five elements of gamification. What if you can gamify the job? So what happens if you pay someone X dollars per hour versus you pay them, you know, let's say, you know, 20 bucks an hour for a young adult, or we'll pay you $50 to do this audit that will probably take you an hour. Half an hour to, to put this stuff together and half an hour to talk a client through it. If you pay someone by the hour, they have a disincentive to get it done faster. Yeah, it's going to take longer versus they, if they're being paid on the job and then the customer is giving you one to five stars, now all of a sudden I'm no longer the boss. Now we're on the same team yep. trying to get the customer to give us five stars. Why do you think Uber or Airbnb or Fiverr or Fancy Hands or these other networks work. These two-sided networks work because they gamified it to where you're being paid per task and there's a rating. So you have to do a good job because you don't want to get whatever, anything less than five stars. Even Uber's Mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Actually, I remember something from the home service. When I was in high school, I worked as a locksmith and one contractor I had for commercials called ESC Mobile. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, I had that. I had ESC Mobile and um, it was called uh, Desco. Yeah. That was, there was two parts of it. Yeah. It's interesting. I had like three phones. <laughs> you know what's funny is back in the day, I've learned a lot about algorithms and I've done done some affiliate stuff. I've done, you know, there was a time where my business partner, Locksmith, had um, a thousand GMBs within New York City. Oh, wow. I mean, th- there's ways. So right now, I think the way to do it, and I tell people this, is uh, 
white hat is the way to go. Mm-hmm. Build your business on a solid foundation. Yeah. Uh, but so many people are like, you know, the hardest part is that I hear every day is, mm-hmm. where do I start? And I go, you don't know where to start because you can't tell where the holes are in your business. So mm-hmm. if I was in a sinking boat, where would I start? The biggest hole. The, the biggest hole. Yeah. So I, I got to go into your business because everybody's different. A lot of times the people that are listening, they have the hardest time at talent acquisition mm-hmm. and training. Mm-hmm. So there's a couple things that need to happen. I need to recruit the right person. And I don't like hiring, hire the right person. I like recruiting because that mm-hmm. means they're leaving a job yeah. for a career. Yep. And then you got to orient them. And then you got to tr- um, train them. Mm-hmm. And biggest one is retain them because it mm-hmm. costs a lot more to get someone new. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit about... How that, what do you, when you guys are so systematic in your standard mm-hmm. operating procedures, what would you guys recommend for the listeners to go out and find the problems in their business that maybe don't have the systems and may, maybe they are, maybe they're one time, they own the business. Yep. They are everything. They answer the phones, they do the dispatch. Yeah. yeah. So what do you recommend to someone like that? So if you want, I'm happy to give you guys what we call our DMTS, our digital marketing training system. So this is how we bring people in. They have to actually do the work before we hire them. And it's not us trying to get free labor. It's them getting a taste of what it's like to go through the training and apply that training immediately. Then we assign them on real projects. And they start out as a level zero specialist. And they move all the way up where they gain multiple skills. And they unlock other tasks that they can work on. Now, the, the idea of the employee life cycle, which is something that is true for every single business, is you have to first train them on the thing that they want to do and make sure that's in alignment with their goals. A lot of the young adults, they just need a job because their parents are all over them saying you need to you know, pay for college, you're, you're graduated, now you need to do some stuff. So once they go through the training, or as they're going through the training, we have them go through what we call our three by three goal sheet. You want to talk about that or I'll, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll talk about it? We should talk about it. So imagine tic-tac-toe, right? You yeah. have short, medium, long-term goals. And you have personal, physical, and professional and they put three items in each of these boxes so that we can see you as a person. So what, who is Tommy Mello as a person? He's not just an entrepreneur. He's a family man, he works out a lot, he, you know, he, he helps other businesses. There's all these things that you have to do. You heard the, the shoe brand ASICS, mm-hmm. right? And that's, yeah, yeah, that's it's Latin, long and, it, and it stands for animo sane and corpore sano, meaning a sound mind and a sound body. So if you're not physically healthy, then emotionally, or if there's something wrong relationship-wise, then you're not going to be able to focus at work. But if work's not going well, or you don't have a job, then you're not going to be able to, you see, like they all work together. And just for fun, because a lot of young adults, and even old adults, they don't want to fill out forms, right? So if they don't fill out the form a week later, then they get a video from Grant Cardone. And Grant says, hey, Dennis told me, you didn't fill out your three-by-three goal sheet. Now let me tell you about why that's important. I set my goals every single day. And here's what, and then I check at night to see how I'm doing. I set my goals for the next day. You need to get your three by three goal sheet going. So we have these cameos that come from friends of ours that, that are built into the training. Because what happens when you think about training? Like it's like, oh, it's training. I got to sit there and like, it's like, you know, the drunk driving thing. You just click next. It's That's tough. Not, it's not engaging. So how do we make training fun? Because if they're not engaging, they're not going to be paying attention. It's going to be like, okay, I got to sit here for an hour. I'm going to be surfing the internet while I'm sort of halfway paying attention to this video. This is the trouble with all the learning management systems. How do you have accountability to know that they're actually doing it? You could have a quiz or a test, but how do you make it actually enjoyable? You know, that's a good question. And my LMS, what you got to do for me is I'm not here as advanced as you guys, but you got to have five minute spurts. You got to tell more stories. Storytelling shoes. You've heard of the story brand. And, yeah. and really what people always ask is, why did you guys come up with this stuff? Why don't you let us use the customer's bathroom? So I tell a funny story about one of my guys breaking a customer's toilet. And literally, I had to buy her a $2,000 toilet. But, you know, I am curious. Learning to me is never... Been, I like reading. I like, you know, I think I have 400, 850 audibles. I, I, yeah. I enjoy it, but... I don't know if I ever loved. They got that new thing called lu- luminosity or lumosity that, yeah. that's supposed to make it fun to learn and remember. But how do you make learning fun? Well, I'm very practical because so, I think that if the learning doesn't tie to their ability to make money, they don't have an incentive, right? And the other part is it has to be entertaining, but it has to clearly satisfy an economic interest. People that are in their early growth stages where they're under forty, they're trying to marry their girlfriend, they want to. You move out of the apartment and get a house. They're trying to buy a new truck. When we appeal to them by saying, hey, you can move from making an average of $20 an hour to $40 an hour, 
that makes a lot of sense. And then we make it fun because we bring in other people, just like you do this with the podcast, that sure. know how to do it. For example, Ashley Furniture is the largest furniture manufacturer and retailer on the planet. They have 710 stores. They do a lot of money. And their employees were just salespeople, right, on the showroom floor, out there selling furniture on commission. So if you don't sell furniture, you don't make any money. Right. And we know that reviews are very important. We know that personal branding is very important to bring customers through the door. And our reviews were horrible, right? When you look at all the stores and think about thousands of retail sales staff and they're, they don't really care about the reviews because it's like any other furniture salesperson is like another salesperson. So we put a program in place where we would every month at the sales team meeting provide snacks and provide gift cards to those who got the most reviews or got the most accolades. We made it important. And by doing that, we were able to raise that. So our average rating was something like 4.7, 4.8 across all the stores that we had. And that drove a huge increase in sales. And that, a year ago, so we thought, this is great. Everything's going fantastic. And then we just discontinued having those meetings, discontinued. Because literally, you go into the break room, and you'd see this worship wall of snacks and fruits and all this. And like, make sure you get your reviews. And the, the printouts of all the reviews that we've gotten, right? So we, we're showing right. it's important. But for some reason, we just sort of, we thought, you know, we got, this, we got the game down. We, we got, got a nail. And then what do you think happened? They fell off like anything else. And then we had to restart the whole program again. You know, this is some systems. The, the one thing I've learned here, this is really, really probably a gold nugget that I've never said before on the podcast, is I see, I had a lady call me three times in the last two weeks about carrying this nice light that goes on a garage and it illuminates as when it's up. And I said, I'm really not that interested because here's what I found. I could find decorative hardware, all kinds of things, but when you stick to a core and you just teach the core, the core is all you need because mm -hmm. I, if I want my guys to sell memberships, we'll talk about memberships for two weeks and all of a sudden memberships will go up or sales will go down. Like every time they could only handle a certain amount and focus on that. So when you start, when you start building your training program, I remember my, my GM used to ask me, why do you say the same thing every week, but just in a different way? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you got to beat it and beat it. And once they think it, once they feel like it falls off, they'll fall off. Yeah. It's crazy yeah. how that happens. You and should say it and saying it again. And, and I, then saying it again. And then, yeah, you know, you said something earlier and it reminded me of a book because in my opinion, there's no such thing as a balanced life. You can't, mm -hmm. you're not going to have a six pack, work 24 hours a day, uh, be praying to God every hour right. and be the healthiest person on this earth. It's just, so right. there's a good book by Dan Thurman and I actually seen him speak. It's called Off Balance on Purpose mm. because if you're around family all day long and you just, you think you could just be around your daughter and son to be their soccer coach and baseball coach and be to every event, and you think you could work out all the time, you're probably not working very much. So mm -hmm. I do agree, find what somebody wants. So people ask me like, well, how do you get through to your employees? And I'm not the best at it, but find out what their goals are. Yep. Instead of saying, if you can make a hundred grand this year, say, let me ask you this. What, if you could do something really, really fun this year, mm -hmm. what would it be? Maybe a fishing trip, maybe they're gonna say fly, my, my in-laws in because they meant they meant a lot to me my whole yeah. life whatever that looks like and really have them set i yeah. want to be able to pay for yeah. my kids tuition for yeah. college i want to be able to buy my son's first car yeah. i want to be able, whatever that looks like and start talking in those terms mm -hmm. because they don't know what most people don't care about money and here's what i've seen every guy that i had making fifty thousand, mm -hmm. they go to eighty thousand. do you think they have money no they don't all of a sudden they go from 80 to 120 you think they have money no they don't no they never have money. I don't care how much you give these guys. I got a guy that made $152,000 last year. Mm -hmm. He has one car. He has a nice house. He doesn't have money. And so what I did is I got Dave Ramsey's penny saver mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. and got him going through that. But then again, I paid $7,000 for training for over 200 employees and 12 of them have used it. Oh, man. <laughs> so but I, what I could do. At 600 bucks each. Why don't I give gift cards for every time they complete something? Uh -huh. But at the same time, I got to give them gift cards so they could save money. I don't uh, like. Don't you want to motivate yourself? Don't you? But they don't. You don't give them money. You can lead a horse to water. Yeah. Well, I tell people this. People are like, you know, I'm going. I'm on this great. They go, why do you invite people into your office? Why do you tell them everything you're doing? I go, do you want to know a little secret? I can tell you exactly how to get everything you want in your body, your body to be perfect, and five quick things: eat right sleep right, consume your liquids right, meaning don't drink a bunch of calories, take vitamins, and work, and do a bunch of cardio, yeah. and you will be, drink a lot of water, you're gonna be really, really healthy. 
The problem is there's no secret diet that's, that's right. just going to make right. you invincible. Yeah. It's like people want to have their cake and eat it too. So I'm like, look, I'll tell you how to get there. You need to have really good systems in place to know mm-hmm. what's going on in your business. Because I yeah. could go out here and say, I need to fix Google, but I'm losing $25,000 in TV. Mm-hmm. So, so many people, they just, they don't know where to spend their time. And what I do yeah. is the first thing I give my managers is a sheet of paper. And I say, I break it into 15 minute increments. Mm-hmm. And I say, I want to know what you did. More importantly, I want to know every time you got interrupted. Because mm-hmm. it sounds like to me, you have no idea what your time management is. Yeah. You wait for your last big thing, the big thing of the day, you wait to the last minute and then you kick it off to the next day, then the next yeah. day. Yeah. But they have a hard time identifying what that big thing of the day is. They go, well, how do you know what your big thing is? And systems, and more importantly, software and technology these days, Mm -hmm. I don't think there's really a COO is going to disappear. It's a CTO. Mm -hmm. It's understanding technology to kind of give you where you need to be spending your time is where you need to focus. And that's what my CRM does for me. It says with this guy, we need to work on conversion rate. This guy's average ticket stinks. This guy is spending an hour to do a 15-minute task. Mm -hmm. He needs to get retrained in this. Yeah. And I love technology because people are listening going, how could he have all that data and how does he analyze it and how does he do it? But see, nobody should have more than five direct reports. And I feel like this is the reason you have laws in a business that goes up yep. and down, up and down because you start taking on too many direct reports yep. and then all hell breaks loose. And you go, now I was managing six, we were doing great. Now I'm managing 20. Yep. I would say Jesus Christ only had 12 disciples. <laughs> you know? so, um, so tell me a little bit more. So how do you manage that? You know, I mean... Sounds like the airlines was a great way to learn all this stuff because the airlines have so many issues. They have so many. They have baggage. They got you got to book the right flight. Yep. You've got this last yep. minute flight that you got to yeah. lower the prices, yeah. and then you know there's all these safety. There's tires. There's air yeah. pressure. There's yeah. I think all the things that go wrong, and well, yet not many people crash and die. I don't even like to think about it because <laughs> I'm on a plane all the time. <laughs> well, let me ask you this, Tommy. Let's say that what's your favorite airline? I fly Southwest a lot. So do we. We got companion pass. I saw you pulled out your Southwest card you that? earlier. Yeah. And I got the, I got the yeah. A-list and the companion pass. So and I've just hit 5 million miles. Oh, really? Mark and I have been all over the world yeah. at all these different conferences. But let me ask you. So Southwest, sometimes we buy tickets at the last minute. costs more, right? Yep. Even though you have free bags and companion and all that. But let's say that, that we started... Den- or there was another upstart airlines, Giuseppe Airlines, and... They offered $1 flights with no extra charges, whatever. Everything's exactly the same. It's just $1, but there's a 1% chance they're going to crash and burn. But 99% of the time, it's fantastic. The service is great. Everything's first class. But 1% of the time, it crashes and burns. Would you get on that airline? Get on the flight? No, there's not even... I've looked up helicopters due to the recent stuff going on, what the chances are. And I don't even want to get on a helicopter, but... I probably would in the future, but no, I would never take that 1% chance. Although if I was in a surgery and right. they said there's a 10% chance, uh, but literally like I needed a new hip or I was, uh, I'd be like, uh, if they said there's a 10% chance you won't walk, but I was walking and I could barely walk, I'd probably do that. But you're talking catastrophic. You're talking yes. death. Yes. I mean, so you wouldn't do it, right? I think you guys would not, even if it was way cheaper, even if there was a heart surgeon, but let's say yeah, you're... You know, you have a, a daughter that needs this crazy heart surgery, and you went to the best surgeon, of course, but then there's another surgeon who's like, you know what, I'll do it for one-fifth the price, but you're twice as likely to die. Yeah. And so what, what you said, Tommy, is the distinct, distinguishing between catastrophic failure versus an acceptable failure. And that's, so the way we build processes around that is we create something we call graceful failure. So graceful failure is a failure that isn't catastrophic. So the flight's late by 15 minutes. Okay, you grumble. All right, the bags, they didn't get through in time, so they come on the next flight. Or they didn't get your drink in time because by the time you know you had to land, they had to put everything away. Or someone's like, all these things are minor irritants, but those are all pieces of graceful failure. And the way you have graceful failure is you have backup systems. So if the avionics don't work, you have backup avionics. If the flight attendant calls in sick, you have the ability to call in other people so maybe it's late because they got to pull, pe- pull another aircraft or pull people from somewhere else. So think about applying that kind of thing. And in the airlines, they have a group called OR. And most of the big companies is a group called OR. You know what that is? Operations Research. These are the guys that build systems and processes. And they are super genius. So think of yourself as working on your business, not in your business. And your business is a machine. And you're seeing what the different parts of the machines are and like how they interact. And what are the parts that seem to fail a lot? 
Let's build processes around that so that there is a backup system. We also call that hope for the best, prepare Power for, for the, the worst. worst. Yeah. Right. So you want you want to allow your people to succeed, but if they don't, what's your backup? So you never want to have a single point of failure. If you have one person who's in charge of this particular system and they hold you hostage, do you have a backup? Not because you don't trust them, but you want to have that in place. So when you start thinking about that, it's not because you're conservative, but it's because you're thinking about your business as a system that's independent of who you are. So when it comes to, for example, goal setting, so people, they come in and give us their three by three goals, and then every quarter we say, hey, Tommy, how do you do against your goals? And if you didn't meet your goals, or if you missed one of them, you wanted to take the trip to Hawaii, you wanted to buy a new car, you wanted to pay off your credit card, if you didn't hit that, we are jointly responsible. So therefore, if I'm your coach, Tommy, it's partly my fault because I'm supposed to be helping you achieve those goals. So I'm not your boss. A boss is there trying to catch you in the act of doing something wrong and punish you. Right. But me as your coach, I want to help you. It's my responsibility to pull whatever resources and connections and projects to make sure you're working on the things that you want with the people that you want, with the lifestyle that you want. So I think one of the biggest things about a system is I, uh, you've heard I'll always be closing. Yep. I, I say I always be recruiting. Yep. And so many people have a hard time. I think the hardest thing in a business is getting the right people and training them properly. It really is. The difference for me is several hundred thousand dollars per employee. That's really the difference. If I got a guy that I got a guy that did one point three million last year, I got another guy that did four hundred thousand. Now imagine if I switched those four hundred thousand in sales. But look at it this way: people put so much emphasis on the people out there that are face to face. But if my average jobs just say for sake of numbers a thousand, and they're taking thirty calls a day, mm-hmm. one's booking twenty nine. That's twenty nine thousand yeah. dollars. One's booking twenty. That's nine thousand dollars a day. Now let's just say they're working two hundred days out of the year. Mm-hmm. How much money is 9,000 times 200, 18,000, 1.8 million. 1.8 million dollars your CSR lost you. So, mm-hmm. so many times we get these office staff and we don't put enough emphasis on these people. Yeah. And I love when we, cause I'm thinking about systems and I'm thinking about people and I like what's called, I like to be disconnected sometimes because I don't want the business to evolve around me. There's a good book called Built to Last. Right. They talk about Jack Welch, about yep. a good leader should leave his business better off when he's not there than when he's there. That's right. And that's by creating a depth chart. And that's by saying, if this person doesn't come in and this person doesn't come in, will the system still run properly? Yep. And it takes time because I have to say, you got to have a full-blown, really nice org chart. Mm-hmm. Because there's not two people. When it's three people in the business, you'll never reach this. Right. So your goal should be to fill in the voids I love marketing and I love sales. Yeah. I built a really good team around me because I hate financials and I hate pivot tables. I like to see everything <laughs> in a nice chart. And I like the pictures were the thousand words to me. I'm like, you're awesome. You suck. You guys need to work together on selling struts. You're great at this. You're not. You need to work together on this. He's good at this. He's good at this. You're bad at this. You're bad at this. You guys train each other on this. So we do a lot of ride alongs and, yeah. and there's a lot of role play that goes into it. But I hate the word role play too. And no one likes the word role play because some for some reason guys have a hard time with role play. And I, I get it because of the connotations that are applied to that. But you know, there, there, there's a lot of more. There's a lot more things I wanted to get into. But I love the word coach. I'm not your boss. I'm your coach. Mm-hmm. And I got three. I got two things we could do. Three things I could do for you. This is what I tell my employees. I could either manage you up. I could manage you out. Or I could find another position within the company because maybe we didn't find the best position for you. If you got a f- will, I'm going to find a way. Uh, you guys, I had a question yesterday. We're doing a little bit of consulting. And the guy said, what is your thoughts on social media for home service? Mm. And I said, that's a really, really tough question. First of all, I need to think about the lifetime value of the customer. Right. If it's a pool business or not. Mm-hmm. Then I need to think, what I, do with, with, what I do with people is I draw a pyramid. So I draw the upside down pyramid. And here's how it looks. It's an upside down pyramid. It's pretty simple. These people on the bottom need your service today. These people up top, they never heard of your service, but they might want it, but it's a funnel. So you mm-hmm. need to be able to work with them to yep. get that funnel down. But is your service something that people might be interested in? Like, is it a really nice garage or once they learn mm-hmm. that it's 40% of your curb appeal? Mm-hmm. So with social media, I think of social media and billboards and sometimes TV radio as top of funnel, yep. not Google or Bing. That's bottom right. of funnel. Right. They're coming to me. Right. So I want to hear your guys' take on that. So certainly bottom of funnel is good for DR because if someone is typing in the Google, new garage door, garage door replacement, then they're very much, in, it's, it's great demand collection. 
you're not going to see that kind of search on social media. So you have to incept them through these three stages. And what Facebook and Google, LinkedIn and Twitter, they use the exact same terminology. They call it awareness, consideration, and conversion. Now a lot of people like to say it's just top and bottom of the funnel because it's easier to think that you're trying to build relationships, you're trying to plant the name, better call Saul, that way, oh, I'm going to call that lawyer, right? Because I'm going to get, you know, and so you're trying to get the name there and then hope that it's going to help you win when it comes to Google because they've seen your name before. But actually, it's the, the ROI of social and the way you manage social is, is the exact opposite. So we think of social as integrated in your operations, not some separate thing you hire an agency to do. Think of it this way. If you've got a home services business that doesn't take good care of their customers, that doesn't do good work, what do you think's going to happen with the reviews? They're or what the bad. customers are saying? They're bad, bad reviews, bad right. customers. Right. So, but if the customers are happy, and if the contractors you send out in the different vans and perform jobs are collecting that feedback, and we're able, where I might, you know, go to Mark and say, let's let's say Mark is one of, you know, I, I'm a lawn, you know, I do homes, uh, lawns and gardens, and I say, hey, Mark. You know, do you like the lawn that I did for you? And I trimmed the, the trees and the bushes. Like, oh, yeah, it's fantastic. Well, you know, my, my boss wants me to collect these reviews, and it would really help me a lot if you could, like, give me a give me a 15-second review and tell me what you think about the yard and the job I did. Would you be willing to do that? Yeah, of course. Right. So now we've got that on my on my iPhone and send it back. And there's software that does. You can choose whatever. There's lots of things. Yeah, we use BirdEye, yeah. yeah. Yeah, to do that. So think of social as an amplification of what you already have. So if, if your business is a minus five, well, that's we, reviews we, we times ten, right? But social and jump everything in social, everything in digital is a review. When someone clicks like, that's a review. When someone leaves a review, that's a, well. What about when you're video, doing a sponsored tweets? ad? That what I'm asking for is paid Facebook. You guys do a lot of paid, right? The, the issue is not how do you set up ads on Facebook. Yeah, we we spent a billion dollars on Facebook ads. That's why people like to ask us questions about how do you set up Facebook ads. But the issue is not really that. It's upstream of that. It's the ingredients that you put into the machine. If we're not putting in good one-minute videos and what your customers are saying and interviewing your staff and what they're doing, it does, no amount, you can't make chicken salad out of chicken shiitake. No. You, you can't overcome that. So it's, it's always with, especially home service businesses, they don't want to get on video. Pull out your phone and do a 15-second video. Say, hey, it's really hot in, in Gilbert and it's in you know, July in Phoenix or something, right? Or just like, just something. Yeah. So they can see who you are as a person. So they can see your staff. They can see your personality. You share your knowledge, right? <laughs> that's funny. I got a website called Sales Pocket Video, I think. I want to pull up an article real quick that's really, really important. That's why I got on my phone. Sorry if that was... I actually, when I'm taking notes most of the time, it's because I'm, um, I'm taking notes. But uh, let me pull up. The, it's basically all about... Um, Follow up because I think the biggest problem I see with most home service companies actually, every company I can think of has a big, big problem with follow up. And here it is. So, this is um, some stats about follow up. What? So, yeah, I scream sometimes on the podcast. People are used to that. So, 2% of sales are made on the first contact, 3% of sales are made on the second contact, yeah. 5% of sales are made on the third, 10% on the fourth, 80% of sales are made on the fifth. To 12 contact 80 percent on the fifth to twelfth tell me a little bit about that because social media works the same way uh, everything yeah. works the same way so tom you probably heard and you guys out there that it takes six to ten touches or exposures before people buy right you guys have probably heard that that's why you see the frequency with things like tv ads and direct mail guess what the frequency is on social now in 2019 so we did this for a major electronics company where they it's, it's a company that you've heard of how many touches before people buy this piece of equipment oh man I'm guessing it's something like 22 it's 17 oh, 17 so touches now why is that that's triple what you would have in traditional advertising well I'm scrolling through I don't know is it because I'm just less I, I'm, my brain is being overloaded yep with 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 social I'm seeing yeah I mean, and geez, I'm on Inst you got Instagram, you got you got a million different things. You mm -hmm. got Twitter, you got MySpace. I'm just kidding, but <laughs> the, the, funnel, still alive. the funnel of awareness, consideration, conversion is just longer. You have more chances to, to get that across. And people are doing research in the top of the funnel. They're not ready to get their garage door fixed. They're not ready to do their. They're not ready to you know fix their toilet. But when they are, and the and the average amount of time between when you have a first touch all the way to when you close them has increased. So instead of being two weeks, it now might be six to 12 months. Yeah, that's interesting because we need to be top of mind. So top of, top of mind awareness, right? 
But also, here's the biggest mistake I see with home service companies. They are, in a sense, top of mind. With 95% of our brains are are living in this, this that you don't even know what you're thinking, right? It's the back end of your mind. It's, I don't know, the, the, the hypothalamus or something. But when you, when you go through, when you're picking on Google, you say, you know what? I recognize A1 Garage for a service. I'm yeah. going to click that ad. Yeah. So your conversion rate, your click-through rate goes through the roof. That's right. And all of a sudden, you're paying way less and you're, 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 you're just buying your own keywords. Mm -hmm. So what's crazy about that is I see people spending all this money on billboards, radio, TV, uh -huh. and Facebook, mm -hmm. and social, and they suck on Google. Everybody goes yep. to Google once they yep. need something done. I, need, I can't get out of my garage. Where do I go to find somebody good? Mm -hmm. So I tell people this. You're spending way too much time, energy, and money on these other things that just amplify Google. That's right. I can't find you on Google. Right. You're spending all this other money. So I think yeah. it's important, especially for when you need something done. Like I yeah. need this right away. Now, if you're doing something like awnings mm -hmm. and it's more of a luxury or or epoxy flooring mm -hmm. and it just looks nice, yeah. I think that's a different story. Yeah. And it's more brand, you're creating what you guys call awareness. Yeah. It's just this stuff, I just love this stuff. Um, so talk to me, you know, I, I still, I know we can make money on social media. It sounds like that's your expertise and, and review and finding out what's wrong with your business yep. online. Yep. Um, and I've had things at Facebook ads. My book, my book was, we mm -hmm. killed it with Facebook ads. We do good with consulting, stuff like that. But, and then I got another software, I think, oh, it's called Ninja Blaster that we could blast into groups. It's kind of like, um, uh, what, what do we use for social, not social, it's, uh, there's different software to post mm -hmm. on you know, all your Facebook and everything else and it's timed and it's, you put on like, there's a science to it where you put a fact and then a video and then a joke. Yep. Um, so tell me a little bit about spending money though because I think a lot of people have tried Facebook and mm -hmm. they go, I just don't get any results. Yep. T tell me what the secret is to get results with paid social. So we hear that all the time. It's like friends of mine that'll say, like Billy I Jean. Yeah. Well, you know, we power his back end. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, all the systems there. I kid you not, there's a gym owner that came to one of our VIP workshops, and he said, I tried Facebook ads, and it didn't work. And I said, really? Well, what if I went into your gym, and I worked out really hard for three hours with your top personal trainer, and at the end of that, I said, I don't have six-pack abs. Your thing's a scam. It didn't work. Your gym didn't work. What do you say to that? Right? And Gary Vaynerchuk and I have been on stage before, and he'll say, What's the ROI of your mother? I'm like, Gary, you can't use that anymore. There is a measurable ROI. You can't just like eject that way. And here's what you do. Remember Mark talked about the, th the three stages in the funnel of awareness mm -hmm. to consideration to conversion? Most people, because they don't know any better, they start at the top of the funnel and move down. Because Facebook and Google and these other guys move based on remarketing, which is the next thing you do, if you start off in the wrong direction, you're going to end up over here. Because you might find that the most engaging stuff is like cat photos and babies. It has nothing to do with driving leads necessarily. Taco Bell killed Yokero Taco Bell. Remember that thing with like the chihuahua and all that? Do you yeah. know why they killed it? Because it made them think you're eating cats? I don't it, know. Because it, it was really high engagement, so they thought it was winning, but they found it didn't increase preference for people eating at Taco Bell. It didn't drive sales, but it got people to say, Yokero Taco Bell, and it's funny, but they, it didn't sell more tacos. Same with the Harmon Brother videos. Yeah. Seen those? Oh, yeah, I got that book that I, um, Poop, it's uh, something. Turning Gold and Poop. Yeah, Turning Poop Gold, the gold. Poop, yeah. 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 Yeah, the poop, all I remember was poop. So instead <laughs> of starting here, which can cause you to go down the wrong path, start down here. What does that mean? It means feed the signal into the algorithm. Have your Google and Facebook and Twitter remarketing pixels, right? It's yeah. not hard to do because when those pixels that you, you understand. Conversion. But, but not everyone understands what a remarketing pixel does. They think that only big companies can do remarketing. You only need to spend a dollar a day on this. You put those pixels on the website, and then anytime someone's been to your website, wherever they go on the internet, they watch videos on YouTube, they surf, you know, look at ESPN for the sports. It's like a cookie. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's they're not just a cookie. There's other ways that they do it, but then you know when you when you look at a hotel or whatever and it follows you around, you looked at that one thing. You want to be able to follow people around. How much money are you losing from people that come to your site? or come to a property you have, or come to your Facebook, or come to whatever, and then they're off to something else, or they chose someone else, but they forgot about you because it was just at lunchtime, and they forgot, what was the name of the A1 Garage Door, or whatever, I don't remember the name of that company, right? So you start here, and this, this gives you immediate ROI. It works super well, as long as you have people coming to your website. Right. As long as you have an email list, because you can tie in your MailChimp or Constant Contact or Infusionsoft or whatever, you can tie those email addresses and match it back to Google, Facebook, YouTube, and these other guys, right? Yeah. So if you find that this is working, and it will, if you, if you have an ongoing business that's driving leads through digital, then you move one step up to drive engagement. 
And then this is what we call the why, or I'm sorry, it goes why, how, and what, which is the same thing as awareness, consideration, conversion. So the how is you're teaching, you know, you're sharing your expertise. Like why, this is why I would set up a garage door this way versus that way. This is what I would do in this situation. This is what, this is the kind of mistakes that novices would make when they're trying to do this particular kind of action, right? And you're sharing that, you're not selling, but you're driving more remarketing. So the more engagement you're able to drive by sharing knowledge, the larger the remarketing pool works, right? Because if, if your remarketing pool is working, then you want to make that remarketing pool bigger because you already know it's working. So then you, you move one step up into the how and drive that into the what, which is your remarketing. Then you move one step up here into the why, and that's about who you are and about your family and about how you work out and about all these things of you as a person, about your book, about how you're a public speaker, to then now people are interested in you and your values. Then they hear about your knowledge which is your how, and then your what. They start buying from you. And this is possible even for small home services contractors, like the one-man you know, HVAC company where he just backs up the truck and he you know, installs air conditioners or what have you. Right? That works for you. It doesn't require anything more than your cell phone and recording nine videos, three plus three plus three videos, just like this, someone holding it. You don't need a fancy setup. That's how social is going to work. It's but, better like that. Yeah. But if you're only doing these silly cat photos or you're doing worse is you hire a social media consultant and they're just posting random stuff like on the news or whatever it is, that has nothing to do with your business and it doesn't sequence logically, systematically all the way down to, to the phone ringing. Yeah, right? you're right. Because you're driving engagement and, <laughs> you know, what I found that works really good is beautiful girls and you can get a lot of people to like that stuff but they'll never buy and really mm -hmm. tracking people to where that buy signal is. Yeah. And I think the best thing you could do in your business is don't get an expensive camera, have somebody use their iPhone mm -hmm. and do 10 FAQs about your business. So That's it. 10 FAQs for me, you know, I used to tell people how to maintain their garage or what, how to program. I've got millions of views on how to program your car, mm -hmm. but I come off as the pro. I'm the professional, I'm teaching people I have people all the time at garage door shows that go, you're the face, or you're the YouTube guy for garage doors. And I came out with these videos 2008, 2009 before anybody was doing it. That's why they got so many views. Yeah. And But, you know, YouTube's algorithm, Google's algorithm for their free stuff annoys me too. The one thing that I know, get paid dialed in because paid will never go. That's away. right. You got to pay to play. And yeah. some people go, yeah, mm -hmm. I've done this and I've done that. First thing I did with my cousin's company, I went in. Colorado Springs garage door company. I interviewed his Google guy. I fired him on the spot. I, we took over his campaign. He got three times. And I said, let me see your ads. Why aren't you getting any good people? And it said, only eligible if blah, 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 blah. I said, who would apply for this ad? I said, let me rewrite this ad for you. So I rewrote it in 20 minutes. And I said, amazing place for new opportunity. If you're looking for a career, not a job, we'll train you and we'll pay you for it. Yeah. We do paid holidays, we do a barbecue every week. Yeah. And then at the end of it, after these two paragraphs I put, mm -hmm. by the way, we do garage doors. Yep. I didn't say garage yeah. door only available, nights and weekends, yeah. you must work. Yeah. And what happened was, he goes, dude, we got 200 applicants the first week. That's awesome. He goes, well, the, the most we've yeah. ever had is three applicants yeah. in a week. Wow. And I said, now you get your pick. So we just solved your people problem. The next thing is, how are you going to train? So then later that day, and this is just a quick thing, I called the guy, and he goes, this is my worst guy. I said, no problem. I said, have him call me on every job. And he calls me, and I said, let me diagnose the door with you. I want you to check this, this, this. Mm -hmm. Your 25-point inspection, I'm going to teach you how to do an inspection. Yeah. And I said, now let me talk to the customer. And I said, ma'am, you're in the right hands. you got one of the best technicians that's ever worked for this company, and he's going to take care of you. I sold the job for him, and he was so happy. <laughs> and then the next one, I sold the job for and I said, well, let me show you the parts. And I said, Mark, go show her the parts, mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So I sold all the jobs for him. Then I said, Mark, do you realize you made $700 today? Mm -hmm. I said, how does that feel? Mm -hmm. Do you feel good? And he goes, dude, I never, and Ryan goes, I've never called my employees. I've never congratulated them or said, great yeah. job today. Yeah. And I said, this is one day of me working with you. Yeah, <laughs> but, that's awesome. But what happened was, is he literally yeah. went from 800000 to doubling. He got out of commercial. I said, there's no money in commercial for this yeah. business for you. Because yeah. people go into commercial saying big tickets. I said, big insurance, big AR. Big, 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 and you're set up as a small company. You're not made to do this. You don't specialize. Yeah. Yeah. One thing that I could tell every company out there is don't be a jack of all trades. Specialize. Be the best at what you do. Don't own every category. Don't say, yet this, this morning we were in our morning mojo call in this room, and somebody sent me a picture, and I said, can we do this? And they said, we can, but we're not going to. And I said, good. That's what I like to hear. I don't want to take on a challenge because 
I know we'll make no money doing it. Let's do what we do really, really well. My dad used to run a transmission shop, Amco. He used to own a couple. And people used to say, shoot, I could get it, I could get it done from the dealer from that. You know, the dealer. Yeah. And he'd say, do you go to a, your general doctor for heart surgery? No, you go to a specialist mm -hmm. because we are specialists. We fix transmissions. That's yep. why they call it Amco Transmission. That's right. We're the best and we get the best warranty, better than you'll ever get from your mm -hmm. dealer. Mm -hmm. So spe specialize. But uh, all right, so let's talk a little bit about branding because I think it's a little bit daunting to talk about branding to a mm -hmm. small home service mm -hmm. company. And I think branding yeah. is one of the most important things out there. I think it's so important to brand yourself. We talked a little bit about it, about making those mm -hmm. videos and the FAQs mm -hmm. and different things like that. How can we automate the branding? I saw you guys take a quick video before mm -hmm. we started. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me a little bit about, so, so, hey, I'm about to install this five-ton unit. These, these people, this you know, this very nice elderly couple haven't had air conditioning. Tell, I don't know. What's the best way to build a brand affordably? So the first thing is don't think of branding as something that only big companies do, like polar bears drinking Coca-Cola. Like what small business would want to waste money doing things like that or Super Bowl ads? Think of branding as something that it's not what you say about yourself, it's what other people say about you. So how do you get into those authentic moments? You hear people talk about being authentic. Well, that means behind the scenes. That means, hey, I'm about to go vi visit this customer. Or you have the customers that are talking about you. You're interviewing other people, right? You don't want to come off as a salesperson but you want to come off as a journalist where you're interviewing other people. So instead of collecting testimonials from your customers, you're interviewing them about their lives. You're actually paying attention to them, seeing what they're interested in. Then you collect that and you have an amazing video editor or your team in the Philippines do all that editing and push it out, like we said before, across all these other channels. It just takes 15 second stories and one minute videos. Lightweight moments with your iPhone. If you make it look like a commercial with perfect lighting, People can spot commercials. People oh, yeah. can see if it looks like an ad, and you're going to get hammered across all the other digital channels. Just like I told you, Ashley Furniture, the first ads that they were running, the first they spent a few million dollars a year on Facebook ads, and they came to us saying, well, our rep said it looked like it was pretty good because we got this, many, this much reach and this many clicks, and this, but we don't know if we drove any sales. And I said, you guys are just wasting millions of dollars. What we need to do is actually collect information and collect videos to show how do you hang a frame properly or how do you decorate the living room the right way, like actually helpful information. And then here's something we did. Then this, this will apply to everybody, to YouTube. So we took the top salespeople in each of the stores and we said, you know what, just tell us about how you grew up. Tell us about your favorite restaurant in town. Tell, not, nothing to do with furniture, right? But we put it out there and we boosted it for a dollar a day for each of these stores. And people started coming into the store saying, hey, I saw you on Facebook. They started, customers, instead of round robin, like you get the next salesperson, they started saying, I want to talk to, oh, what's the guy's name? And I forgot that there's, there's one guy who's in, in the, one of the Ashley, Alabama stores, which is absolutely fantastic. He'd say, yeah, when I grew up, my grandma, we had this go around couch. This, and this, this, we always sat on the go around on Sunday. We watched football, you know, roll tide. They said things like that, and people identified with that. And that's, that's really what people, personal branding is just capturing authentic moments. And you're capturing other people's stories. Well, you know what's interesting is uh, the last podcast I did, I interviewed Ken Goodrich, and he owns Gettle. And if you ever heard his commercial, he goes, oh, yeah. when I was a yeah. kid, I used to hold a flashlight for my dad, and the first one, and he, he's not Texan, but you got me going on Texan. The first one was a Gettle air conditioning unit. They were made for this, that, and the other. And he goes... And, and there's such, you feel like you know him. Yeah. And you're buying from yeah. him. It's kind of like George Brazil. You yeah, see him on the exactly. back of the truck and you're walking back and you're like, that's the kind of guy I want in my yeah. house. And that's that's branding. And it's hard to build branding if you don't know what you're doing. But, it, mm -hmm. you know, there's a science to it. And, and I love this. Give me, give me one more tip. So you, you interview people, yep. you start telling a story, a personal story. I think personal hits home. Yep. It's not like yep. we do drug tests, we do background checks, we're open nights and weekends. And we, yep. you know what I mean? That doesn't, yep. who doesn't do that? Yeah. So familiarity, familiarity. It's a tough one. English was my second language. I didn't learn English when I was seven. <laughs> I spoke Chinese. I don't have an accent because my parents spoke to me in Chinese. Uh, what is, hold on, there's two. There's Cantonese and Mandarin. Yeah, I speak Mandarin. Okay. I'm an ABC, American-born Chinese. Oh, okay. I was born in Dayton, Ohio. America. Nice. <laughs> so familiarity creates trust. And all the studies in psychology show that when there's proximity, 
So Mark and I have been in a lot of the same places. We're more likely to become friends. People that you went to school with, it could have been random that they were in that same class and they sat next to you, are more likely to become friends and you trust them more. Why would you trust that your next door neighbor more than some other random person in the mall? They haven't proven anything, but people, when they see someone, they're more likely to trust them. So by getting that exposure, enough times that you're able to go through know, like, and trust, and, and all of us are in the trust building business. Now the way we do that with poignant stories that reflect mission and meaning is something we call a why story. Now a why story has three components. It starts with when I was, then it goes to I believe that, and the last, pers- uh, last point is I am. So when I was 18, I dropped out of high school. I wanted to be a pro athlete for Nike. I ran cross country, but I couldn't make world qualifying time. Shelly Bridges, the internship coordinator, she rejected me and sent me this letter. I remember her saying, we're sorry that we can't accept you. And my heart was crestfallen. But I had a mentor who taught me how to get into Nike and it was about connections. And eventually we got a million dollar contract from Nike to do social ads and analytics. I believe that when you have a mentor, that they can open doors for you. And that other people who can coach you can help you get more done than you could Otherwise, and a mentor is not a boss or a coworker or a wife. It's someone else who has expertise who's done something that you want. And because of that, I am Dennis Yu and I founded Blitz Metrics. And I love to be able to create mentorship at scale for other people. See, so those three components and learn how to tell different stories. When I was, which gets straight to the point, you don't say, oh, hi, I'm Tommy Mello. I have a $45 million business. No, 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 no. You have to engage them with the moment in time. You point the camera at a particular scene tell that story. Then what did you learn from that? Which reveals the, the larger story, the picture from your heart. And then you say, I, I'm Tommy Mello, I run A1, A1 Garage Store Services, and this is what I do. And I think one of the, the core things about that is, I, I think you gotta relate to your audience. Yeah. So I don't say, man, when I was making 20 million, I say, when I was mowing lawns, yeah. and I was allergic to the grass, yeah. so I knew I wasn't gonna be a landscaper forever. Yeah. I believe that one day there would be something greater for me. Yeah. And because of that, I'm smarter and a better man today. <laughs> See, there you go. Those are the three components. Those are the same components that Pixar uses in their storytelling. So why is it that Pixar and Marvel and Disney, which are all owned by the same thing now, Disney, why is it they're able to, to create compelling stories? It's not because they have better CGI, you know, more polygons per second rendering. It's because they follow the hero's journey. Because they, they're able to start with a why where... Like you said, people are able to relate, meaning empathy, meaning you identify with Rocky. Like Aladdin. Yeah. Or Rocky. Yeah. All yeah and at the end, things. you want to see him beat up the big guy at the end. At the end, you want to see Harry Potter kill Voldemort. Oh, at yeah. the end, you want to see. So if you get people to relate to you. Hero villain. Yeah. Yeah. They, they want to see you go through this typical, it's called the hero's journey. It's a three part Hollywood story arc. And if it'll work for motivational speakers, as you see people on stage, it'll work for people that watch movies and kids' films. It'll work for you as a local service business. I think that's interesting because people sell this dream about you can be just like me, an internet marketer. And I'm so sick, and you guys do this, so I'm sorry, but I'm so sick of internet marketers being like, you could be a millionaire just like me, the four hour work week. You can live anywhere you want and run a business, and don't worry, sell this to everybody. And everybody's selling these agencies. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. you know what I do? I freaking fix garage doors. Let me tell you this the average plumber is 47 years old, it's a dying breed. Enter this journey with me. Because here's the deal, I make a lot of money and I do fun things and I love to work with my hands and this isn't a bad career and there's not a lot of us out there. Yeah. And you know what? It's going to be a lot of hard work, but it's going to be a huge payoff and blue collar is not bad. It's great. That's right. And because you went to the military, it doesn't mean you're a dropout. It means you're a patriot. And I love that. Love it. And it, you know, there's certain things and I'm not saying internet marketing is bad because it's great for some people, yeah. but that doesn't mean these people on the sidelines can't have a great career doing air conditioning, doing plumbing, mm-hmm. doing mm-hmm. remodeling houses or flooring. I think it's important to know that we were founded in the trades, built in the trades, and am the trades. And I think there's a good thing to say about that. And I love these podcasts because they help tell us that there is another side out there. Don't be afraid to get on the internet. Don't be afraid to make those videos. Use your cell phone. Mm-hmm. There's Fiverr. There's, exactly. you know, I use Upwork a lot too. Yeah. And Upwork's a great resource. You just gotta not pick the bad contractors because <laughs> You might end up in a whirlwind of just not yep. getting back to you. So that's yep. what the reviews are for. Exactly. So I got a few last questions for you guys. Uh, obviously, I get a ton out of this. We're going to talk a ton more after this podcast just about cool things and about 
kind of how we can apply this to the whole home service space and make it better. I find the more that I'm out there sharing a story, uh, people gravitate 10 times. If, if I give something great, I mm-hmm. get 10. Th- it's like a boomerang and it comes yeah. back 10 times. So yeah. uh, let me ask you this. What, um, what three books would you recommend? And they don't need to be towards social. They could be – actually, both of you will give three books if you don't mind. I don't yeah. know. Both of you guys give us three books to think about. Uh, we've had so many great books that people have recommended. So you guys go ahead and tell us on anything. could be life, yep. could be health, could be yep. anything. You know, I've read 4,500 books. Oh, that's like all I did until I was 30. I was a complete introvert. So it's hard to pick one. But I'd say at the very top, Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson. Because it's what technology Snow. Looks, Snow Crash. You see, there are entrepreneurs that are looking at things that are commercially viable in the next five to ten years. And there's science fiction writers that are looking at things that are 20 years out. They're just really entrepreneurs that are thinking too far ahead. Right. And that's where I get my best ideas. I don't read marketing or business books. I look at the right kind of science fiction. So Snow Crash talks about an environment where there is no currency and people are able to do whatever they want, but if they do good things, they earn more things like, you know, woofy or whatnot, and what happens when you can communicate and computers are smart. Yeah, and, well, I think that... This, and companies are more, more powerful than governments. Socialism is coming. Yeah. Yeah, you will be It is coming. Resistance In a good is way. Futile. In Two, a good way. Yeah. Two uh, is The Laundry Men by Jeffrey Robinson. And laundry men. I'm not, I mean, I do have a finance degree, but I'm not interested in the, the details of how money's being laundered. But it, it shows you what happens when you follow the money trail to see where the kinds of things that people will do at a global scale. And it may even cause you to be a conspiracy theorist because there are some of these things that are there, but, but it's just fun to see what happens there. But Laundry Men by Jeff Robinson. And number three, which is my favorite book of the last three years, is Principles by Ray Dalio. Oh, yeah. That's a that big book. That will change your mind. Now, if that's too big, you can listen to his podcast. He's got a short video. I think it's like 17 minutes, and he's released a new app that's got a condensed version. It shows you how to be a logical thinker and overcome bias, especially in building teams, and he ran the world's largest hedge fund, Bridgewater, because he was able to make logical decisions not based on emotion. I love that. And, the, the you know, the facts... I make I, 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 I could talk for more. Uh, Mark? I, I'm just going to throw a few quick ones out there. Yeah. If you'd ask me in the beginning, I probably could summon up some more recollection. I've heard a lot of books, too. Um, crack Hour, just for a good read, because we only do good read now and then. Like into crack the Hour. hour John like Crack Hour, Into Thin Air. So yeah, in the wild, in the thin air. Just, just yeah. you know, you got to throw some good books in there too. They can't all be, you know. Um, there's a book I can't quite remember the name of it right now, but it's by Lyle Loundis. It's about uh, like personality traits and kind of like interacting with people. Right, what's the guy's name? Lyle L E I L L O W N D E S. I can't remember the name of the book, but um, I, uh, I believe it's a her. It's a really good book. Kind of like understanding p- things from other people's perspective and things like that. And everyone could use a refresher on, especially these days with you know cell phones and um, and uh, another one, becoming a master student. Hmm. So, um, yeah, I think those principles can be applied everywhere. We're always students. Yeah. If you're not a student, you might as well die because I believe that, you know. Ooh, harsh. I'm always harsh. learning. <laughs> no, 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 but if, you're just, if you know everything, then why are you even on this earth anymore? I just feel like if you're not learning, you're usually, there's something else going on. Um, so tell us a little bit about how they get a hold of you and what you guys, I'm going to finish it off with just a final last thought. So just go ahead and tell them what, you know, how do they get a hold of you if they want to reach out to you both and Tell us a little bit about what you guys, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Mark and I are easy to get a hold of. The best way to contact me is to find me on LinkedIn. Okay. Because LinkedIn's got 30,000 connections as a limit. I'm at 23,000, plenty of room. Do not Facebook friend request me. I'm at the 5,000 limit. I've me been too. there for 10 years. People still Facebook friend request me. Do not. Hit me up on LinkedIn. I always reply. It might take me a day or two because I'm traveling and things like that. But I always reply because I want to see you grow your business. You could also email me, Dennis at Blitzmetrics.com. I personally, not a virtual assistant, I personally respond to emails there. Very good. And I'll go a step further. I have my LinkedIn URL if you can't find me because there are a lot of Mark Wagners. Mar- LinkedIn.com slash in slash mark.u.wagner. And uh, you can also give me an email at mark at seniorscorecard.com. Okay, and if someone will, so I'll let you guys kind of finish it up with whatever you want to talk about and one last thought. And like I said, yep. you guys, whatever you want the audience to know, and you guys close us out. So in the same way that you go to a hospital and a doctor is going to collect your vitals, diagnose you, and then make a recommendation, 
we want to do the same thing with your digital marketing. And we've put all of our training out there for you to be able to inspect and be able to look at exactly how this stuff is done so there's no black box kind of magic. I would encourage you to look at our checklist, look me up, ask me questions, and my hope is that you're going to say, you know what, there's so much stuff here, I want to hire one of these certified young adults to be able to do it for me from Oklahoma Christian University, from the University of South Wales, from uh, BYU, right? we've got a lot of Mormons in our program, but we're not Mormon. We have a lot of these universities, and, and that way you're able to create jobs in the local community and be able to grow your business at the same time. Our job is education, and I've always been an educator, and that's what's meant the most to me. You know, it's, and a lot of people say, oh, it's because you already made a lot of money because you were an early exec at Yahoo, so now you can say, only rich people say these kinds of things. But that, no, that really is what means a lot to me. And we create jobs by helping local service businesses. Mark, you want to add anything? Oh, I think you said the best. All right, guys. Hey, thanks for listening, and uh, we'll see you soon.